praise your name. Expository listening, hearing God's word like your life depended on it. This is part five. The title for this morning's message is A Listening Life, Constantly Paying Closer Attention to the Things We've Already Heard. The text is Hebrews chapter 2. I hope you have your Bible with you in one form or another. Always have a Bible with you in church. Hebrews chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. Hebrews chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. I'm reading from the English Standard Version. The writer says this, chapter 2, verse 1, Therefore, we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard, lest we drift away from it. And he seems to hold up these two options. Uh, How many things have we all, myself, you, how many things have we all heard about the Christian life? count all the sermons, all the books, all the classes, all the seminars, all the tapes, all the Bible studies, how much have you heard? And the idea I think that we have is if you hear enough things, it will keep you from drifting away from the faith. And what the writer says is that's close, but not quite the truth. If you pay much closer attention to the things you've already heard, then you won't drift away 
from the faith. But just amassing a certain volume of stuff taken in doesn't automatically assure spiritual steadfastness. It's the attention that you give to the things you've heard. And that's slightly different. We must pay much closer. How much? Closer. How much attention do I need to give the things of God? More than you are. Much closer attention to what we have heard, lest we drift away from it. The it being all the things you've learned and heard. They aren't self-sustaining in your life, nor in mine. Verse 2, For since the message declared by angels proved to be reliable, and every transgression or disobedience received a just retribution, so he's talking about judgment now, God's wrath against people who don't listen, don't obey, How shall we escape if we neglect, not deny, just neglect such a great salvation? It was declared at first by the Lord. It was attested to us by those who heard. While God also bore witness by signs and wonders and various miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. Let's pray. We bring, we bring our minds and we open your word and we ask for your Holy Spirit to quicken both. Quicken your word to our drowsy minds, our fallen minds, that we might be, Jesus, as you said, sanctified by your word. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. It's the essence of wisdom to learn early the difference between the things of the Spirit of God and earthly things. Not necessarily wicked things, just earthly things. The things of the Spirit of God and earthly things. To learn the difference between them. It's a bit like this. The rich truths of the Spirit are modest in nature. That is, they usually lie fairly silent awaiting for a wholehearted searcher to dig them up like gold. The writer of Proverbs says that. Gold doesn't pop out of the ground like a plant. You have to go after it. So spiritual truths are modest in nature. Earthly things are usually insistent in nature. They they clamor, they advertise, they produce commercials, they make movies, they serenade you with music from morning to night. Earthly things flash their ideas before your mind. Before you get up in the morning, earthly things have their sparkling plan of seduction and attention getting all ready to go by the time your feet touch the floor. Earthly things are aggressive in the way they go after your attention. Spiritual things lie silent and await your emphasis. Wise people learn the difference early in their Christian walk. That's why you'll notice the constant warnings in the scripture. We don't drift toward the things of God. We drift away from the things of God toward other things. Other things are more naturally magnetic to us in this fallen world. Now what that means for pilgrims en route to a heavenly kingdom... What that means is the things we need to know the most come least naturally. And the things we need to know the least come most naturally. Earthly things just pour into our lives through the doors of instinct, impulse, desire, Reflex, entertainment, 
the things of the Spirit are grown only through exercising deep, concentrated, persistent, brow-wrinkling attention and focus. That's the, that's the big Google Earth picture of our text and what it's trying to say. I get asked all the time, I'm not very good at this. I get asked by people all the time, they, they hear about Cedarview or they see it on the internet or they see what we're doing or they've visited the church and they'll say like, uh, boy, it's, it's, uh, seems like kind of a happening place. What's, what's your, you're the pastor. What's your, what's your vision statement? And I usually look at them and go, I, I don't know, I got a Bible teach it, we pray, uh, worship God. Does that count? Any of that, you know? (laughs) And as I think about it, it doesn't look very good on a plaque. It's always the great mission of the church to get people to give serious attention to God. And that's why we're here, right? I said last year that as much as I find it hard to relate the whole concept of vision statements or mission statements, I'm not against them, I just, I'm not good at it. I think, I think I would say that the goal of this church, anybody asks you, now you'll be able to say, and they'll think I know what I'm talking about, Okay. If someone asks, say this, the goal of this church is to help create a people who know more about God than they know about anything else and who care about God more than they care about anything else. To create a people who know more about God than they know about anything else and who care about God more than they care about anything else. That's why this church is here. This text explains why this mission is never fully completed before Jesus comes again. However much attention is directed toward the things of God, our efforts are always in competition with other interests. And so if you just, I'm just going to break this text down this morning. I have about five or six points that I'm hopefully going to go through fairly quickly. Here are the insights I would take from this passage. One. Careful listening distinguishes between what's important and what isn't. No one can give attention to everything. The context of this text reveals why the things of Christ should claim first place on your serious attention list. 2.1 says, Therefore, we must pay much closer attention. And right there, that first word, Therefore, It tells us why. Why the things of Christ are more worth listening to than anything else. Here's how it works. The therefore, at the beginning of chapter 2, verse 1, points back to the whole message of chapter 1. The point is made back in the very first two verses of this book of Hebrews. Long ago... At many times, in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. You've got that, your Old Testament. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. And then he keeps going, and he, and he makes this idea even more vivid in verses 3 and 4 of chapter 1. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. He upholds the universe by the word of his power. I mentioned it before. I love the way Abraham Kuyper talked about the sun didn't just rise this morning. It wasn't just the law of nature. It's because Jesus said, do that again. And the sun came up. He upholds all things. Upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, 
He sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to the angels. He talked about the angels. There have been messages that received revelation from angels, revelation from prophets, but now he says we have, we have the word of Christ. And he says it's as much superior to angels as his name that he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. So the reason the things of Christ call for more devout, serious attention is really simple. The reason we must give more attention to the things of Christ is there has never been a revelation like this before. There have been prophets, there have been angelic visitations, there have been visions. There are other religions scattered all over the face of the earth, but there has never been a message like Christ's, and there has never been a messenger like Christ. And this deserves more attention. That's what he's saying. Therefore, seeing this... Christ has come. He has revealed his word. He has spoken. He sustains all things. He's the heir of all things. It's all heading toward him. So the writer says, whatever you thought you had before, it's nothing compared to this. This deserves attention. This is our pronouncement, people. This is our pronouncement to a world full of religions and prophets and visions and gurus. None of them compares with this message of Christ and with his work. That's the whole point of Hebrews chapter 1. That's what the therefore in the first verse of our text, 2 1, that's what it's there for. That's what it's focused on. I want to just pause here for a bit. I hope you sense how countercultural this is, what I'm saying from behind this pulpit today. It's unacceptable. It's politically incorrect. Our text begins with the premise that not all messages deserve the same hearing. Our text says one stands above all in terms of the place it deserves in our study, in our listening, in our thought, in our devotion, one is far more worthy of your attention. Therefore, seeing as we have this kind of revelation, we must give more attention to it. If there's one thing I know for sure, including myself, if there's one thing I know for sure of all of us in this room, none of us gives too much attention to the things of Christ. It deserves more attention. Be open-minded enough to give this radical truth place. Don't edit it. Don't try and put it in more politically correct speech on the basis of trends of our culture or social acceptability. If you give ideas, all ideas, equal weight, you will never grow in the things of Christ. The reason the things of Christ should count most with you, I'm sorry, the reason the things of Christ should count most with you is they count most with God. He's not democratic at all in this aspect. He reveals, he decrees. Point number two. Okay, we'll have to go a lot quicker than that. The price of attention, we're talking about listening here, must be paid before the benefit of the truth can be received. I know this seems obvious, but it's striking to me the way the text emphasizes this point. Look at chapter 2, verse 1. Therefore, we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard. It's not a very profound sentence. It's not hard to understand. There's a lot of monosyllabic words in it. But it's just this past week that I was startled by the meaning of words that I've read my whole life. And suddenly I was hit with the force of that verb, pay. Therefore, we must pay attention. 
Really, that captures the idea perfectly, doesn't it? You, you never actually give your attention to anything substantial. You pay it. And there's all the difference in the world. That's why we talk about paying attention. Did you ever say that to your kids when they were going through that age when they were about 13, 14 and knew everything that there was to know? And you would stop and say, you know what, you just need to pay attention. And you probably hit the word attention instead of the word pay. We all know about paying. You go into a store or you go online. You see something of value. You want it. But you can't just take it. Before you actually receive it, you, in one way or another, must pay for it. In other words, it costs you something to receive it. You you part with something else, in this case money, you, you part with something else in order to receive something else. And And here's the thing, you part with the money first, at least if you're smart. You part with the money first. You, you have to give away before you get. That's, we get it. That's what paying is all about. Now to the point of our text. This is what listening to the word is all about. And, and unlike the purchasing illustration above, you, you, you can never receive spiritual food on credit. You simply have to pay first. Grace is free, but you have to pay your attention. You pay in time devoted. There's all sorts of people here. You don't even have a regular devotional life. And the reason is you refuse to pay the price of 30 minutes a day. You won't pay. We're all on track here. If you don't pay, well, then you can't, can't have. Pay attention. You pay in time devoted. You pay in books read. You pay in, this applies to so many people, you pay in terms of friends held close and friends with whom you must part company. You pay You pay in going to church instead of staying home and watching TV. It's costly. You pay in hard-fought memorization of God's Word. But in one way or another, those are just samples. You, You pay attention. You may give attention to things that are trite, useless, and empty. The way you can sleep on the couch with something on the television. But you must pay attention to the things of God. It costs. That leads to the third point. Compared to the attention we give other things, we must give closer attention to the things of Christ. To one again. Therefore, we must... We looked at therefore. We must pay. We looked at pay. Therefore, we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard. That word, closer attention, parasoki, it it means abundant or exceeding. It means an extremely detailed, exhaustive examination, that kind of attention to spiritual things. It's talking about the difference between looking at a fly on your arm and looking at a fly under a microscope and you see totally different things. And this means no one will get what the Holy Spirit wants him or her to get from God's Word just by thumbing through a few verses just before you, you know, fall into unconsciousness at night. And no one will get what the Holy Spirit wants him or her to get just by looking up once in a while from doodling or texting during a sermon. 
This verse is simple and clear, yet contrary to our normal way of thinking. How many Christians just moan and whine that they don't, they don't grasp spiritual things? How many Christians just pray that God will give them understanding? And he will. But he's already said how he will. Examine the word. Look at the things that teach and point to Christ like you would look for your lost contact lens in the drain of the sink. Have you ever done that? I'll tell you the times when I was dating Rini and she would lose a contact lens in her apartment and it's in the trap on the sink and you take the thing off the sink. It's not good. This is, how, this is how you look for the things of Christ. And you take everything out and you pull everything apart, gingerly, delicately, piece by piece, strand by strand, and oh, there it is. There's the contact lens. Pick apart everything down to the details. Handle every piece of truth gingerly, deliberately. The text answers our question. How closely do I have to examine God's Word? And here's the answer. More closely. Much more closely. When your mind can only handle so many ideas, when your schedule will only allow so many appointments, is this sounding familiar? When your stamina wanes and you can't possibly handle all you're called upon to deal with, remember, God always has first claim on your attention. Listen to him much more closely than anything else. That's the rule. Well, what if I don't? You're going to drift, lest we drift away. That part of it is out of your hands. The paying attention part is the part you can control. The results of whether you do or don't, that's not in your hands. It's going to happen one way or another. Four. The text actually tells us how to increase our listening capacity to spiritual things. It's in 2 1 again. Therefore, we must pay much closer attention. And then he says, to what we have heard. Now, you can, you can zoom in on this verse just by looking at its opposite. The opposite of paying much closer attention to what we have heard is described in the third verse as neglecting our salvation. How shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? I don't have to deny salvation to lose its benefits. I can simply neglect Salvation, the same way, the same way I can just neglect my health. You don't have to put a gun to your head to neglect your health. Just eat all your meals over there at Five Guys. You know those burgers and fries? Enjoy it. Do it three times a day. It doesn't feel like you're neglecting anything, but you are. The way you neglect your health is, you simply don't consider it. You don't have to hate good health. You simply don't mentally rehearse and apply the details of what you know good health is and how good health is sustained. You just neglect it. You neglect it while you're doing other things. It's amazing to me that people don't understand the way the Christian faith thrives and exists. People who will spend money and go to the gym and work on their abs and find it hard to go to church regularly. And you think, are you kidding me? Really? Work on, work on, your, on your abs and your pecs and everything else till the cows come home. You're still going to die one day. Very, very, very soon. I'm talking about eternity. You haven't got time?
And so the writer urges that much closer attention be paid to what we have heard. Let me be very specific here. What does that mean? Pay closer, much closer attention to what we have heard. It means a conscious breaking down into details of the things we already know generally. That's what the much closer attention is. He's calling these Christians not to just rest on general concepts and slogans. Here's the rule. General concepts will rarely capture the mind with great delight and devotion to Christ. The general concept is Jesus died for my sins. It's true, preciously true. But that's far too shallow to sustain a robust faith. Did Jesus die for your sins or did he die to surrender to the will of the Father? Or did he die to bear God's wrath? If so, did he die for me or did he die for the Father? Or did his death somehow accomplish both? How does his death affect sins that I don't forsake and repent of? What's the relationship between his death and resurrection? What if he died for my sins but never rose from the dead? And if God's grace comes through Jesus shed blood, how did Moses and Abraham get to heaven? See, details. Think. There are answers to all those questions. And they're precious, beautiful answers. Turn the microscope down closer and closer. Let your heart begin to salivate after glorious truths. Jersey Shore will take your mind into barrenness and fog that will never be able to sustain faith in God. Wake up. Five. There are great and eternal dangers in not paying Closer and closer attention to the word. 2 1. Therefore, we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard, lest we drift away from it. Note those powerful last six words lest we drift away. It's the only two syllable word. Lest we drift away from it. No one would lose spiritual life if he saw its loss coming. I mean, no one craves a lost eternity. But that's not how decline happens in the walk with God. Spiritual decline happens the way gray hair happens. It just comes when you're not thinking about it. Ladies, don't laugh. We all know that underneath four or five coats. How we need to hear words like those last six words. I mean, they paint a picture of, of contrasts. The biblical writers seem less worried about disturbing listeners than we are today. Hence, both the duty of paying closer attention and the danger of drifting away, they're, they're both held up as being valuable concepts to learn. There's great benefit, apparently, both in encouragement and in warning. And in this fallen world, apparently we need them both because the writers constantly give us both. Again, to drift isn't to deny, at least not at first. To drift is simply to, to forget the things that we have heard by not holding them under the microscope of meditation and study. Something else. This kind of neglect never seems to matter a great deal in the early stages. So, so, so you don't come to church for a couple of weeks. I get that all the time. So, Pastor Don, <laughs> God going to send me to hell because I miss church on Sunday? And the answer is no. 
But, but unless you were sick, I know everybody works shifts. I know there's reasons. I'm not, please, I'm not talking about that. I'm just talking about I just don't feel like it. But let me tell you this. Something did happen to your soul last Sunday. You just don't feel it yet. You never feel neglect in the early stages. Never. Drifting isn't the same as falling. Drifting isn't the same as crashing. But it can be just as fatal in the end. You just don't see it coming. I had a great friend in Bible college. Let's call him Gene. It's a true story. He was one of the most naturally or supernaturally gifted Christians I've met. Ideas and wonderful music flowed out of him like I've seen in very few other people that I've ever met. He was instantly grabbed up by churches who craved the kind of talent that he possessed. Two years ago, I was at our general conference in Edmonton, and I met another close buddy, and I asked how our mutual friend was doing. And his response was, oh, you won't believe it. I just bumped into Gene, and he told me matter-of-factly that he's now an atheist. Now, I know Gene pretty well. We served for years together on the same pastoral staff. And I know that if he were here, he would tell you that he encountered issues that he couldn't answer. Or he would say that he somehow outgrew his early simple faith. But that's all a bunch of fluff. I almost said something else. Fluff. Atheists are made, not born. And what happened to Gene is, somewhere along the way, very gradually, he stopped considering the details of truths that were big enough to sustain his faith had he made the effort. He simply drifted, and he's too proud to admit it. Because I keep my ego intact if I sound like, you know, there were just my mind is just a probing mind, and I came up with questions that I just couldn't answer. And that rarely happens. The reasons for drifting from the faith usually aren't intellectual, they're, they're moral and spiritual. And the writer of Hebrews wrote prophetically about this kind of drifting it can happen to anyone who is lazy enough or distracted enough to let it happen. And the Bible's honest enough to warn of the judgment that comes to those who simply neglect what they've heard. Look at Hebrews 2, 2 and 3. For since the message declared by angels proved to be reliable, reliable and every transgression or disobedience received a just retribution, how shall we escape? if we neglect such a great salvation. Six. Last point, about three minutes. For those who desire to shun deadly spiritual drift, just very quickly, it's striking the way the writer of this very warning also urged a remedy. He, he saw a spiritual key, a practice that would, would not only keep people from drifting, fight off the negative, it would not just keep people from drifting, but it would actually produce an opposite positive effect, a practice that would actually encourage and revive faith in careful listeners. It's in Hebrews 10. 23 to 25. Look up these verses. Hebrews 10, 23 to 25. For those who desire to shun deadly spiritual drift. 10, 23. Let us... 
Hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. And I think you can see right away, hold fast has to be the opposite of what we've been talking about, drifting. It's, it's, it's about being anchored. It's about making sure that there's nothing that's going to shift you off in a bad direction. Nothing that's going to make you become careless or indifferent or distracted. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. And let us consider, okay, much closer attention, pay much closer attention. Consider, you see the parallel? Let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works. Not neglecting, okay, neglecting. How should we escape if we neglect? Not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more, as you see the day drawing near. Listening well always involves listening corporately. This is not to deny the importance of your own personal study and personal devotion. I've already talked about that in this message. But the problem with just that is none of us listens honestly all alone. We need, we need the sharpening influence of others' insights in the ministry of the church and the teaching of the church because we are all biased in our own favor when we just read the word by ourselves. Don't forsake the body of Christ because whatever else you do, you will drift without this. You will drift without this. You may die without this. And so the answer to the clever question, well, Pastor Don, you think we're going to hell because I didn't come to church last Sunday? Ho, ho, ho. Well, no, not because you missed one Sunday. But you can start a trend of not listening to the word. And, and how shall we escape? Those aren't my words. If we neglect... Not deny, just neglect such a great salvation. Everyone said?